If you were trapped in a haunted house theme park with a psycho killer stalking you, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made by the six friends, see if we can make better choices, and ultimately attempt to beat the other in Hellfest. I've always thought that a haunted house would make for a good killing ground. It's dark, foggy, everyone's wearing identity obscuring costumes, other employees won't easily know who is and isn't an employee, there's plenty of ways to sneak in and out of the houses or parks, it's easy to get close to other us, the victim, totally not instructions to harm, thieve, or kill innocent people, YouTube. We are the victims here. It'll take a while for people to realize an actual murder spree is going down, since they'll just think the murder is an act, or the bodies are convincing props made with red dye and corn syrup. That's if the bodies are found. There's a million ways to hide a body in a haunted theme park. The longer time to find bodies is important, because it means the killer can smell the roses, so to speak. As a victim, time is not on our side. Once the deed is done, there's all sorts of secret doors and passageways to quickly escape through, with pre-planted costume change points to throw the tail if any witnesses got wise. I'm actually surprised this hasn't happened more often. Again, not advice. This is just how a killer might think about a haunted house. It's going to be difficult to defeat the other. He stands a good chance of walking free if he's careful. It's Halloween and three girls are hitting up the Orange Grove Community Fair's Horror Night Haunted Maze. It's full of the usual jump scares. One jump scare causes Jody to split from her group in a panic. It turns out to be a dead end, literally. Jody gets stabbed to death and hung up like a prop. I can't fault Jody too much. How could she know that one of the haunted house goons was actually a serial killer? What may have unwittingly prevented her death, however, would have been staying with her group and taking the right tunnel. At the last jump scare, Jody split off and took a left. This was totally unnecessary. She was in the back of the group holding on to her friends. She could see and feel that they were both going right and followed. Even after she got split up, all she'd have to do was back up and go down the other tunnel. Her friends also should have noticed that Jody was missing and done the same. If everyone didn't suck, they'd have met back up at the Y split where they'd probably get murdered anyways since three unarmed teenage girls don't stand much of a chance against a serial killer with a blade. Jody's out. Now it's up to the next group. It would have probably been a better option if the group of friends stayed home and tapped into another country to watch a horror film by using our video sponsor. NordVPN. NordVPN is a fully secure, double encrypted, world's fastest VPN that provides you with a boost in privacy, security, internet freedom, speed, and so much more to surf the web for survival tactics without bandits watching you. NordVPN has over 5,200 servers in 60 countries with no limits, borders, or internet censorship. For me, NordVPN is clutch if I want to cover a movie in a different country that's not offered in the US through the main subscription streaming services like Netflix, HBO, Disney Plus, Hulu, and BBC Films, and avoiding the geo-blocked websites. Skip the bandwidth throttling and use NordVPN to avoid buffering videos. Stream with no interruptions. Another reason NordVPN is great is for finding and using geolocated blocked research. I can take advantage of the educational websites, archives, and databases available only in the EU due to GDPR. You can get better prices when traveling on flights, tickets, hotels, by booking virtually from a different country or area to get the best quotes. NordVPN is quick and easy to use. Just download the app on your desktop or mobile device, sign up, and then pick a location anywhere in the world to connect. NordVPN can also be used on six devices at once. NordVPN is giving you nerds a great deal. Go to nordvpn.com slash nerdexplains to get an exclusive deal for our viewers. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Several years later, uptight final girl Natalie is back from college visiting her best friend Brooke, who she learns is now living with her sworn enemy since kindergarten. Taylor. Nat's out of the loop and feels even more uncomfortable when Brooke and Taylor tell her that her high school crush, Gavin, got them all VIP tickets for Hellfest, knowing she was coming. Upon arrival to the park, Taylor and Brooke's boyfriend, Quinn, tell Nat that people get murdered in theme parks all the time, and specifically mentions a girl who was gutted and hung from the rafters in an Orange Grove haunted house two years ago. In this day of smartphones and internet, it's surprising Nat, being the studious type, doesn't pull out her phone and check the story the second Taylor brings it up. I definitely would have. A simple Google search would reveal a string of murders at haunted houses over the years, with the killer still at large. Is it going to stop them from going? It wouldn't stop me. Just because a kid was abducted by an ice cream truck doesn't mean you're not going to snatch a bomb pop from one on a hot summer day. Hellfest looks dope, 
especially the Deadlands and their Hell Maze, where the monsters can get physical with you, which coincidentally is the perfect place for a killer to snuff someone's life out. Still gonna go. Statistically, one person getting shanked out of millions visiting haunted houses per year is negligible. Now, I said I'm gonna go, but with certain precautions taken. Despite what the sign says, I'm taking my phone and a weapon. Being unarmed only makes my paranoia worse, which is bad for everyone. At roll call, the girls catch up with Taylor's boyfriend Asher and Nat's missed connection Gavin, who are waiting with VIP bracelets. As you'd expect, the park lives up to its name immediately. Masked scares, dominatrix demons, and cages, and every fog machine known to man running on full blast. And shots. Lots of shots. Meanwhile, our anonymous killer, The Other, makes his way into the park too, bypassing the metal detectors unarmed. Once inside, he dons his deformed face mask and clocks a girl in the crowd mocking the fried actors. Already having selected his first target, he swipes nice pick from a snow cone stand and begins stalking her. You'd think after a spree of haunted house murders, Hellfest would be surrounded by tall fencing, patrolled by guards or cameras. The park would be overflowed with security guards who actually scanned visitors. I mean, seriously, what about the right side of the guy you just scanned? Security cameras covering all areas of the park, clearly marked fire exits and emergency booths, properly locked up employee-only areas and back entrances. Oh, and long, sharp knives wouldn't be left out in the open where they could get easily swiped. Not that it would have stopped a determined attacker. The other could have easily hit a weapon inside the park months prior to Halloween when there was no security. The other's biggest mistake so far is putting his mask on in plain view. Any number of cameras could have caught the disguise change. It had been better to do it in a camera blind spot to avoid having the mask tied back to you when the police scoured the park footage after the murders. This might be nitpicky, but he should have also worn fresh boots without distinct scuffs. All it take is someone witnessing a masked man leaving a murder scene. The police ruling out all the employees wearing the same mask, identifying a man putting on that same mask when he entered the park, as well as the scuffed brown boots, obtaining a warrant to search the man's home, then finding those same scuffed boots inside his home and his murder trophy closet. And it's off to prison for the rest of his life. His next biggest mistake was not wearing gloves. That should also make him easier to track down. His fingerprints will be all over everything. The odds that the other is going to get caught are going up, though that doesn't matter much for the victims who will die before he gets caught. The friends enter their first haunted house. House. It's all fun and games until the girls get split up and walk into a classroom with a girl pleading for her life, telling them that he is following her before hiding in a nearby curtain. When the other appears, Nat jokes that he isn't scary and motions to the curtain where the girl is hiding to get him back on script. He drags the girl out of hiding and pins her to the floor. It's too much for Brooke and Taylor, so they run out. But Nat stays. When he raises the ice pick, she tells him to just do it already, and he stabs the panicking girl to death. Nat assumes it's part of the haunted house and leaves to find her friends, looking back to find him watching her a few moments later. We could point out the fact that the girl did not look like an actress, or the knife stabbing looked too real, but it is completely reasonable that Natalie thought it was part of the haunted house, especially when similar skits are being performed by other employees. This ain't on her. The only way the innocent girl could have survived was with clutch decision making. Hiding behind the stage curtains makes it look like you're part of the act, isolates you, and gives you no way to retreat. If I was the innocent girl, I'd have stayed with the other three girls. Obviously, I try to explain that I wasn't an employee and a murderer is in the maze. But if they tell me off, I just rush back out the way they came in and flag security to watch all the exits for a man with his description and to swarm the maze. Hellfest should be taking these issues seriously with the haunted house killer on the loose. With how slow the other stalks, I think they'd have caught him. The group hangs out for a bit. Nat and Gavin jump into a photo booth to make out. Unbeknownst to them, the other is still following them. He steals their pictures and walks away just as Brooke spots him. Brooke chases him into an empty behind the scenes section of the park, but she stops when she hears him humming and scraping his weapon along the railing. Now back with the group, Nat's concerned the haunted house employee is taking things too far, but the others just think he's going for employee of the year and set their sights on their next theme park section, the Deadlands. Even if Nat's friends were right, stalking is something everyone should take seriously. It can and often does lead to violence. Statistics from the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence suggest that as high as 85% of women who survive murder attempts are stalked prior to their attack, and 54% of female murder victims told police that they were being stalked before they were killed by their stalkers. Seeing this guy once is one thing, but seeing him twice and then having him steal a personal item is something else. If nothing else, Nat should pull out her phone and record the other whenever he appears. This way, when she's later attacked and goes to security, she can present them with at least some evidence that she has reason to be worried. They won't be able to dismiss her claims as hearsay or exaggeration. Even though this is is a common 
and mask worn by employees in the park. Video footage could be used to alert a supervisor that someone wearing an employee mask is stealing from customers. The park should know through various supervisors who is wearing what and where. This can help identify the people that are out of place and narrow down the search. A smart supervisor might recall all employees wearing that mask to a back room and then tell security that they should hold anyone who doesn't come and is wearing that mask as a potential imposter. Nat should give a full recount of the events too. The security might even realize that there should never have been a deformed face mask person in that part of the maze, and there shouldn't have been a murder act performed. This could raise their suspicions and make them check that part of the maze. The other couldn't have moved her body far with all the foot traffic, and based on previous killings, he may have hung her up. Once the body is found, the other's time is up. Brooke makes a near fatal decision to follow the other into an isolated area after he steals Nat's photos. It should go without saying that $10 photos are not worth confronting a man who's been stalking you through the entire park, who, by the way, probably stole the photos and fled to a secluded area as bait for an ambush. He sure as sh didn't steal them for their high value. Good thing Quinn pulled her back in time. She was one minute from becoming a prop. When Brooke returned to the group, she acted like she scared him off, when what she should have done was tell them that she heard humming and a knife being sharpened. If I heard this in the park, okay, but this was the back shed. There shouldn't be real blades that are being sharpened. It's not a good sign. Gavin ditches the group to double back to the games area to get Nat a toy. When the game barker won't give him one, he sneaks into an employee-only locker room to steal one. In the locker room, the other ambushes Gavin. Before Gavin can leave, the other trips him with a mallet, then uses the blunt end to crush his windpipe. As he tries to crawl away, the other smashes his head to pull. Gavin, 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 you've already made out with Nat. You know she likes you. Splitting up and leaving her alone to steal a 10 cent toy from an employee locker room is just really dumb. He'd be better off returning to the group and surprising her with a stuffed toy when they meet for a date a couple days later. Not to mention, a man has been stalking your group for a while now and has stolen your picks. The last place I'd want to go was some isolated locker room by myself. As soon as the guy cornered me in an isolated area outside the park zone, I'd be in fight mode. This is not an actor, especially after he physically bumped me since we aren't in the Deadlands where touching is allowed, and especially since he has a weapon, has been stalking them, and has stolen their picks. Everyone's too nonchalant about this deformed face mask guy. When the other shoulder checks and blocks Gavin's path, his best course of action is to immediately disorient the masked man and then return to the public area of the park and track down security. When the other raises the mallet to prevent Gavin from leaving, Gavin should have decked him with the right hook. The small eye holes and lopsided design of the mask already limit the other's visibility, so he won't see it coming, and hitting him once should impair his vision long enough for Gavin to get away. When the other tripped Gavin, he should have been sprinting out of there, not whining, bro, why did you trip me? Then he should run to security and explain the whole situation with this dude. Gavin was too passive, and now Nat's alone. Now at the point of no return. The remaining five friends are funneled into a park ride called Night Bumps, which will lead them into the Deadlands. The ride breaks down halfway through and red emergency lights flicker on to reveal the other, standing in the dark, watching Natalie alone in her car. As he stalks towards her, Natalie tries to get out of her seat, but the safety bar restrains her. She screams for help. When her car rolls into the ride's exit, her friends see the other sitting on the lap bar, leering over her. He turns to stare at them as another person wearing the same hoodie and mask steps up behind them and to the left and right of them. They stop freaking out when they realize it's a scare tactic of the Deadlands to plant a creepy masked guy in a car with a single rider. If Nat was that freaked out, she should have slipped under the bars. It looked like there was enough room. Pushing up on it is futile considering it's designed to resist upwards motion. What part Park employee is going to keep the act up when a girl is legit screaming for her life. And what park employee is going to hop on top of the safety bar like that? It's actually another major OSHA violation that applies to theme parks. Not that Nat could have done much at that point, and the dude didn't have scuffed boots. The friends finally reach the Deadlands. Now the employees can get physical, and killers are harder to spot. A group of deformed children are there ready to guide them deeper into the triple maze that acts as the entrance to hell. In the triple maze, the girls and guys split up. The girl's maze looks like a set out of house on Haunted Hill with dismembered patients and a crazed doctor. The guys come across a jump-scaring drug addict on the floor.
floor. Once again, the other stalks the group and grabs a syringe she finds in one of the rooms. Soon, the girls wander into the Hall of Hands. When Taylor and Brooke break free, they leave Nat behind. It takes her so long to break free that the hallway slides sideways, leading her down a second secret corridor. Nat stumbles alone into the next room where the other taunts her again. She finds the door and bursts out, running to join Taylor, Brooke, and Quinn who were waiting for Asher. Asher got separated from the group and ended up in a body pit full of bloody dummies, all save the other, who tackles Asher into a pile of prosthetics and stabs him through the eye with a syringe, slamming it down deep into his skull. This place is a death trap even without the psycho killer running around. Sure, these people signed a liability waiver allowing people to touch them while in the Deadlands, but using real props like this metal syringe and an axe the other will later use is likely an act of gross negligence. Then you have the motion-activated moving wall that slides sideways quick enough to crush someone if they trip or stop suddenly. Asher had no way of knowing that the other was waiting in the dark to ambush him. He also likely could not have prevented himself from being floored. With his right arm pinned by the other's knee and left hand holding back the syringe, Asher's in a bad spot, but it's not checkmate yet. Gravity is working against Asher, and the other has more strength and leverage here. Instead of trying to repel a stronger opponent, he needs to redirect the energy while pushing outwards with his left hand to divert the other's force. He needs to knock the other out of a control position with his legs by pushing his hips up into the bridge pose, forcing the other off balance and sending his weapon away from Asher's eye socket. This bump will also free his right arm. Movies would lead you to believe that a simple pimp smack from right field will end this fight, but you can't generate much punch force at all from the bottom of a mount position. Instead, Asher should tuck his head and squeeze the other's torso with his now freed right hand to avoid the ground and pound, while pulling and locking the other's syringe-wielding arm into his body to not only prevent himself from getting stabbed, but also to roll the other off. Allowing the syringe arm to be free will result in him shanking you down. This wouldn't be as big of a problem if the other had a standard half-inch subcutaneous needle, but homie's got a 3.5-inch needle. This could easily reach and puncture a lung or heart, which are only about an inch and a half from the skin peristernally. Will it be enough? Who knows? But at least he now has even odds. Outside, Nat gets slimed by a monster and goes to the bathroom with Brooke to clean it off. When Brooke leaves, the other steps silently inside to join Nat. He responds to her text to Gavin to catch up with him, and when she hears Gavin's phone beep in the bathroom with her, he blocks the door to her stall and begins to rattle it. Nat crawls under the stall wall to get away, only for the other to reach down from above and grab her. She breaks free and runs out, finding Brooke nearby. Unfortunately for these two, Hellfest wears its liability waiver like a suit of chainmail. When they try to get to the nearest security guy to take the attack seriously, he says there's nothing he can do given that there's about 15 people scattered across the park wearing the same mask as her attacker. Even when Brooke finds the photos Nat and Gavin took lying on the floor, the guard suggests Gavin is pranking them and tells them that ultimately being scared is the whole point of the park and someone out there is just doing their job. Yeah, there was no reason for Brooke to leave Nat alone when she's terrified of a stalker. How the hell is this bathroom empty anyways? When she texted Gavin and immediately heard a ringtone in another stall, that would be far too much of a coincidence for me. I'd have checked under the stall, where I'd have seen his scuffed boots, then bolted out of there, or just ran back outside and texted Gavin a personal question only he would know the answer to. Wrong answer, and we'll know something bad has probably happened to him. Sliding under the stall seems like a clever move, but we are hearing all the drama music. In reality, it's quiet. He would 100% hear you crawling on the floor. It also puts you in a vulnerable position. I'd have gotten up on the toilet for the high ground and called my friends to help me while screaming like a little bitch. This is the epitome of police being minutes away when seconds count. Don't bother. She stood little chance once cornered in the stall though. Nat got lucky that this was yet another taunt. Once free, video evidence of him following them could have come in handy when talking to security. With Gavin and Asher unresponsive, now is the time to leave. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that they're already dead and well hidden amongst the rubber corpses. While security could escort them out of the park to safety immediately, it's never that easy. When they return to Quinn, they learn that Taylor has volunteered herself for a guillotine performance. Nat notices that the executioner's boots match the scuffed boots of the other who attacked her in the bathroom and panics. She tries to stop the performance, but security holds her back. The guillotine blade falls and a blonde head rolls across the stage. It's a fake, of course. The show closes, the curtain swings closed, and Taylor pops her head up from where it was hidden behind the guillotine. The other stalks forward and slides her neck under the real guillotine blade. He removes his hood to reveal the lopsided mask underneath. Taylor begins to call for help. The other pulls the lever on the guillotine. The blade slices into Taylor's neck. Of course, Haunted 
houses don't usually use real guillotines, so the blade leaves a gash instead of removing her head. The other rewinds the blade for another go. While he's distracted, Taylor manages to escape, but the other pursues her into the crowd. Okay, let's just move past the obvious issue. That semi-sharp guillotine blade is a huge safety issue. It should be made out of plastic like any cheap prop would be. More importantly, Nat should know better than to panic like this when she thinks Taylor's in trouble. Approaching security in a crazed manner is only going to make them react as if you're unstable. Instead, she could have approached the stage from the front and climbed up to interrupt the show before they could release the lever. In the moment she has before getting pulled away by security, Nat needs to tell Taylor that Gavin and Asher are in serious trouble and help her get out of the restraints. Taylor should have realized by now that any skit or device set up by this OSHA violation of a theme park should be avoided, but she had no way of knowing the other would be behind the executioner's hood. When he forces her forward under the blade and straps a belt around her throat, she should be screaming her head off. By that point, the noise outside has died down and screams like that should bring the entire security team and stage crew running. When she's free, it's bizarre that she runs away deeper into the park instead of finding Nat, Brooke, and Quinn. She just made excuses for Nat's panic to the security guards, so she knows that that's where she'll find protection as well. Once running through the park and realizing that people around her aren't going to help her, she should run until she's out of the other's line of sight, hide and wait for him to pass by, then call the police and text our friends to meet her so that they can run to the exit together. Walking and screaming with the other right behind you is about the worst thing you could do. Again, it just makes you look like part of the show. Quinn hears Taylor screaming and runs to help. Taylor begs passerbys who watch in confusion, and then tear as the other slashes her face and stabs her in the gut. Quinn tries to intervene and takes an ice pick to the chest and abdomen too. We already covered Taylor's mistakes. There's no saving her now. By the time Quinn got to Taylor, she was already seriously wounded. You could say that Quinn should have stayed back since Taylor was already dead, but there's still a chance she could survive if the other wasn't able to follow up with another stab to a vital area. It looks like the ice pick went into the right shoulder, far away from the heart, which is slightly left of the sternum, potentially hitting along at most. Even if Quinn didn't see exactly where she got stabbed, generally there's a decent chance stab victims can survive if she got to an ER right away, especially with an ice pick that won't cause as much tissue damage. Point being, she's not a total lost cause, and trying to save her isn't foolish. Quinn tapping the other on the shoulder to ask him what's going on was weak. With Asher and Gavin missing, Nat screaming a killer is after them, and now Taylor is screaming and running from that same guy, you'd think he'd take this seriously and enter with a rear naked choke, sucker punch, or a tackle. Tackling is dangerous, since you'd get entangled with a man who has a knife. Even if you have his back, he can still stab you. A rear naked choke, properly applied, could put him out in 5-10 to 10 seconds, still long enough for him to over the shoulder stab you. The sucker punch could divert his attention from Taylor and enable you to maintain distance from him, hopefully long enough for security to get there and restrain him. The silver lining in Quinn and Taylor's death is that now everyone knows that there's a killer in the park, so time isn't on his side anymore. They just need to avoid getting stuck behind a crowd and follow the main path to an exit. Easy enough. Nat pulls Brooke away as the other turns to pursue them. In the background, the park announces it's shutting down now. The other is suddenly seized by security and forced to the ground. His mask is removed, only for us to realize that this guy's wearing red shoes, and he's not the other. I love how the park doesn't even say that there's a murderer killing people. They just announce the park is closing early. I know you don't want to incite panic and cause stampeding, but if a guy is slashing through your visitors, maybe a little panic running is warranted. Most haunted houses will or should have radios on actors and managers at all times. This horribly mismanaged park should have immediately told all their deformed face mask wearing employees to remove their costumes so the killer could be more easily identified. The real masked psycho killer pursues Nat and Taylor across the deadlands. Like idiots, Nat and Brooke duck inside a demon mouth door only to realize it's not an exit, but the maze entrance to the park's scariest section, hell. As they run through looking for the way out, the other enters and finds an actually sharp axe, because of course this park left one lying around. He locks the maze's entrance by breaking off the handle. Halfway through the maze, Natalie realizes they're endangering themselves by running through rooms which have ankle high motion triggers for jump and sound effects, something the other could use to track them. Instead, she pulls Nat into a closet and waits for the other to move past them, then doubles back avoiding sound triggers. Unfortunately, the other had smashed off the door handle. Brooke panics, screaming and banging on the door. Natalie calms her down and pulls her back inside. Really, Nat and Brooke? A demon mouth? How could you possibly confuse this with an exit? Don't tell me you intentionally 
ran into a maze when you know from experience they don't put clearly marked fire exits in them. I can see how hiding in the closet might seem like a good option. Actually, no, I can't. It's an incredibly high odds bet that he doesn't check these closet doors while looking for them. It ultimately worked out for them, sort of. The other closed the entrance door and banged the door handle off, thinking it would lock the door. In reality, that's movie BS. Like shooting an electrical door control panel, he allowed the girls to double back to the entrance. By waltzing past the closet they were hiding in, falsely assuming that they would get stuck at the entrance and he could ambush them later. Of course, Nat and Brooke are both idiots too, and don't even think to put a finger in the doorknob hole to pull it back open. They just cry, yell, and bang on the door without trying to open it at all. With the exit locked, Nat and Brooke try looking for weapons, but the only real thing that they find is a wooden torch and a rudimentary wooden club. Gotta love how the park doesn't want you to bring in any weapons, while filling the maze with actual weapons themselves. Finding the wooden torches and clubs in comparison to the sharp axe that he finds is just bad luck, and ridiculously good luck for the villain. They arrive back at the closet they hid in to find that the door they left open is now closed. Tiptoeing past, they come to a mannequin and possessed doll room, accidentally setting off a trap. The other emerges from hiding and slashes Brooke's leg with his axe. Nat quickly retaliates by smashing her club over his head, knocking him to the floor as they flee. Gee, who could have anticipated that the other would be waiting to ambush them deeper into the maze after noticing the closet door was closed back up when they had left it open. Walking into an ambush, even when you know you're walking into an ambush, is a bad, bad idea. It'd be better to wait in the torture room and set your own ambush. He's on the clock and will get antsy and come, or not, and you buy yourself enough time for the cops to show up. If they are hell-bent on pushing forwards into his trap, they should at least do so with their backs to each other, so that they have a 360 degree view of the rooms as they enter them, preventing the other from getting the full drop on them. Once the other comes out of hiding to attack, we can applaud how quickly Nat uses her club to knock the other down. However, as you've heard me say before, once he's down, she should continue whacking at his head until she feels something squishy. At the very least, she should grab the axe and take it with her, so he can't use it on them again. Nat and Brooke stumble into a room that seems like a dead end of disembodied masked heads. As the other searches for them, Nat dons on one of the masks herself to hide in plain sight. She watches as the other stalks through the middle and finds a hidden exit that lets out into hell, accompanied by a voice telling him he's clever for finding it. Since he didn't hear that message before, the other turns back to the room, knowing that the girls are still in there. He slams his axe into a mannequin, momentarily getting it caught. Nat emerges from hiding and begins hitting him with her club. He drops his ice pick. Nat tells Brooke to run. Unfortunately, her pathetic blows only stop him momentarily. The other gets up and slams his axe into Nat's nose. Instead of finishing Nat off, he pursues Brooke deeper into the maze. I have no complaints about hiding amongst the masks. The problem is with their follow-through, or lack thereof. Nat got in a good swing, but Brooke needed to join in with kicks to the face. Natalie also missed a huge opportunity to pick up the knife he dropped and gut him right after her bat broke. Instead, she resorted to the pathetic stomach kicks, and if you're gonna kick, kick him in the head. I know this is Nat's hero moment, but 1v1 is bad odds, and if he kills Nat, Brooke won't be able to make it out of the maze with her injured leg before the other catches up. As for the other, when he entered the mask room, he should have gone behind the mannequins and started knocking them all down. This way, if Brooke and Nat are hiding amongst them with weapons, they won't be able to attack him without giving away their position first. This would likely cause Nat and Brooke to panic run and give themselves away. Oh, and why not take two seconds to drop the fire axe on Nat's head before chasing Brooke? You could spare the time with how slow Brooke is. This is gonna be a costly mistake. The other catches up to Brooke, stalking forward to land the killing blow, only for Nat to emerge from a motion trigger jump scare door and stab him with the ice pick. The girls flee, running into the cops who enter from the only emergency exit I've seen this entire time. All seems safe, but the other is gone when the cops go in to search for him, finding a smear of his blood on the floor. A police officer informs the girls that he's still at large. The gruesome killings are already radio news when the other rolls into a suburban driveway and enters his home. He seems completely unharmed, despite that gut stab. He hides his lopsided mask in a locked cupboard with a collection of other masks and his souvenir from the night, the photos of Nat and Gavin. He presents his daughter a Hellfest toy as we cut to credits. God damn it, Nat. You had him. Why on earth did you stop stabbing him? Would people please finish the fight when they have the opportunity? At least the other now has a gaping knife wound in his gut that he won't be able to go to a hospital for. I'm no doctor, but I don't think you can DIY fix deep stab wounds with a sewing kit and rubbing alcohol. Of course, the police also 
also suck and don't think to cover all the exits to prevent this serial killer from slipping away. If the other doesn't die from his wounds, we can be pretty sure that the camera footage caught this guy's bare face on camera at the entrance. It's only a matter of time until they search his house and find his poorly hidden collection. With the statements, it'll be easy to find the real blood in the haunted house, and there is plenty to get a lot of DNA. It is very possible that the killer's DNA is not in the system, but with genomic sequencing, it is possible to narrow it down. If this guy slipped up years later and did a 23andMe or Ancestry.com, they could also match him like they did the Golden State Killer. It's also possible with their statements and uncovering the bodies that the police could lift his prints off the guillotine lever, ice pick not kept, the bathroom door handle, or giant hammer Gavin was killed with. Should have worn gloves. Let's see who could have lived or died if we were in control. Jody may have been able to follow her friends down the right path and avoided his initial trap, but the other likely would have caught up and killed her regardless. Brittany, the girl in the classroom, probably could have survived had she ran out the way Brooke, Taylor, and Nat came in. Gavin should have stayed with Nat, possibly enabling him to survive and help keep his friends alive. Asher could have evened the odds, but the other still had the knife in his pocket, so Asher would have gotten killed anyways. Taylor could have kept sprinting for an exit and called her friends once she was in the safe area, enabling her to survive and not creating the altercation in which Quinn was stabbed, so he could survive too. Natalie and Brooke had a few key moments where they could have finished the other off. Even though they didn't, the other will die from his wounds or would have gotten caught by the cameras and fingerprints he left behind. Considering all this, I think the other from Hellfest was beaten. Thanks for watching, and remember, don't put your disguise on in front of security cameras.